Welcome to The Untold with Haiti Buzo. Joining me today is Ali Riza Nader, a senior fellow focusing on Iran and U.S. policy in the Middle East at the Federation for Defense of Democracies. He also researches the Islamic Republic's systematic repression of religious freedom and currently serves on ADL, Anti-Defamation League's Task Force on Middle East Minorities. Thank you so much, Ali Riza, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Today, we're going to be talking about Iran, Iran, Iran. Oh. Um, it's a, a regime that has done so much destruction in the Middle East, um, in Iran itself, and around the world. We will start with an op-ed that you published today at the New York Post with Benjamin Weinthal, titled, Iran's New Push to Erase Its Millennia of Jewish History. I mean, this is, we're talking about a, a case that a lot of people here, especially the Iranian regime's apologists, don't want to talk about. Uh, tell us a little bit more. Uh, we know that what happened is that there is a, a, an attempt to try to destroy the, the shrine of Queen Esther and Mordechai. Tell us a little bit more about what happened and your op-ed. Thanks for inviting me again. So recently, the shrine of Esther and Mordechai in the Iranian city of Hamadan was attacked. Uh, there was an arson fire and the regime in Iran uh, said that there is minor damage and according to reports that have been received by the Iranian Jewish community within Iran, there has been some minor damage to the temple. Uh, it has not been destroyed as was initially uh, reported, but we have to keep in mind uh, that the tomb has been under threat by the paramilitary besiege forces for several months and the attack on the tomb follows also attacks on uh, Christian churches in Iran, as well as, as, well as a Hindu temple uh, in the city of Bandar Abbas on the Persian Gulf. So this appears to be uh, part of a more systematic campaign against religious sites in Iran. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that uh, today, I believe it's Quds Day or Jerusalem Day, uh, according to which the regime claims a well, uh, liberate Jerusalem from Israel one day. And there's been really uh, a very noticeable increase of anti-Semitism coming from Iran through the regime, uh, including anti-Semitic cartoons. That's some horrific uh, uh, images and posters, for example, the Supreme Leader of the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, had a poster uh, that talks about the final solution in Palestine. Just really ugly language. And uh, this is uh, the way the regime behaves when it feels very threatened and under pressure. It really lashes out. We've seen this historically since the 1979 revolution in Iran, and uh, we see it again today. So, you know, some of the, I've, I've seen some of the really most disgusting anti-Semitic and hateful images coming from this regime. It has a history of this, but it, uh, there's been an intensity to it lately. And this regime promotes anti-Semitism in theory and in practice by uh, supporting extremist militias to launch attacks against Israel. And that's been happening since the Islamic revolution of Iran took over in 1979. Correct. These sort of, uh, images and propaganda tactics also really buttress the regime's violent policies toward Israel and across the Middle East, including uh, fi funding uh, violent Islamist groups like Hamas and Jihad as well. So these are not just empty words, they're real threats, as you said. How can we know what is the current state of the shrine of Queen Esther because this is important. This is a historical site that needs and must be protected. The remaining uh, Jewish population in Iran, which is very small, there are about, I think, eight to 10,000 uh, Iranian Jews left in Iran. Most of them immigrated, uh, especially to the United States. But according to the Jewish community, they ha we have seen some photos that show minor damage. But I think this is really a message from the regime uh, to the Iranian people, but also the outside world, that 
they can go after these targets, uh, these important cultural and religious symbols. And when we talk about the tomb of Esther and Mordechai, it's not just holy to Jews. It's a, part of Iran's rich history, it's including its Jewish history. Uh, Iranian Jews have lived in Iran for millennia. And the regime is very reliant on its own totalitarian Islamist ideology to remain in power and has zero tolerance for religious minorities and exploits them when it suits its purposes. When we look at the context of what's happening, uh, the regime is also trying to convince the rest of the international community not to apply pressure against it, uh, to extend the UN arms embargo um, uh, or let it relapse, not, you know, to prevent its extension. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think this is really a message, uh, especially given uh, the pattern of attacks on religious sites, it's no coincidence. Uh, that was actually going to be my uh, next question, which is, do you think that this is obviously a, a plot by the IRGC? We know that everything happens in Iran is controlled by the IRGC in terms of all of these type of, uh, of attacks. What would you say to the Iranian regime apologists here in the United States and around the world who can hear us? and watch us right now, unlike what they're trying to promote about the regime, this regime systematically targets minorities. What the foreign minister of Iran, Javad Zarif, and his apologists in the United States have tried to do is to depict parts of the regime as being quote unquote moderate, uh, meaning more amenable to negotiations uh, with the US and international community. Uh, but I think when we see the regime resort to such hate, it puts uh, apologists in a very awkward position because who is promoting this campaign of anti-Semitism? It's Zarif himself. Uh, on Twitter, he defended Khamenei's final solution poster. And I just don't think any apologist can come up with a rationale to justify uh, this man's actions and call him a moderate when when he talks about the final solution uh, regarding Israel and Palestine. And when we look at the last- and the Jewish months, people echoing the Nazi oh, yeah, uh, message. Uh, you look at the imagery, especially recently, it's very reminiscent of propaganda used by the Nazis. Uh, and so the mentality of the regime really closely resembles the Nazis when it comes to anti-Semitism and a lot of other issues like, as well. Uh, but I don't think Zarif and the apologists uh, can really convince um, most analysts and policymakers that uh, there really is some sort of moderate faction with this regime when it does things like this. And the regime right now faces a very critical time. Mm -hmm. uh, it, even its own members admit that they are fighting an existential crisis. Uh, the November uprising in Iran in 2019 was just only a few months away. And that was really a massive uh, popular revolt against the regime. And the Islamic Republic fully expects uh, more internal unrest in the ensuing uh, months. I think one of the reasons we haven't seen as much unrest in Iran is because of the COVID epidemic. People are not gathering in crowds. Uh, but uh, dissatisfaction in Iranian society is still at, is at a peak and growing. And the regime is also facing really a dire financial and economic situation. Because and I like, wanted to ask you about that, if you can uh, elaborate a little bit about the economic uh, situation inside of Iran today. How, what is the regime and the people facing on a daily basis at this point? It's hor horrendous. I think the population is uh, facing a lot of deprivation. Um, deprivation uh, that really reminds me of the Iran-Iraq war, which I lived through in Iran. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we're gonna experience uh, food shortages, fuel shortages in Iran. I think things are gonna get very, very difficult for the Iranian people under this regime. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, unless there is some sort of decision by, I don't see this administration, uh, the Trump administration behaving like this, but uh, for example, if there is a, a future Biden administration that's more amenable to negotiations with the Islamic Republic, then there's a possibility that the pressure could come off and sanctions can be eased 
Uh, also, but would that even benefit the people? I mean, we saw yeah. during the Obama administration time, the sanctions were lifted, money was going into Iran, and the people situation was getting dire every day, while all that money was going directly to the militias and to the deep pockets of the Iranian regime's officials. So really lifting the sanctions did not show any improvement of the lives of the Iranian people on a daily basis. This was the regime's big lie, <laughs> uh, because President Rouhani, who also likes to depict himself as a quote-unquote moderate, promised a lot of things to the Iranian people. He even said that a new nuclear agreement uh, would be the key to Iran's problems. Uh, instead, everything has gotten much worse under Rouhani. He's anything but a moderate. Uh, he's very much a status quo reactionary, uh, devoted to the Islamic Republic. Uh, even with the new nuclear, even with the nuclear agreement and the tens of billions of dollars uh, that were released to uh, the Islamic Republic, the standards of living in Iran did not improve. Uh, instead, the regime increased spending on the Revolutionary Guards the Ba'ath siege, and religious foundations that control Iran's wealth under the clergy. And this is, one of, this is one of the reasons that Iran, starting in December 2017, experienced uh, nationwide demonstrations, because the people saw that nothing was going to their pockets. Despite all the promises, uh, farmers did not have water, teachers were not getting paid their salaries. Uh, and this is in one of the richest uh, countries on earth, potentially. You know, Iran has vast resources and a well-educated population. Mm -hmm. uh, but in essence, the Islamic Republic is like a mafia. And I think that's the best way to look at it. Even the different factions, including Rouhani's faction uh, versus the other factions, these are all uh, mafia factions that are trying to exploit Iran's wealth uh, at the uh, expense of the people for their own enrichment and for the expansion of the Islamic Republic's power across the Middle East. And you know, what's very interesting and striking is to see how the Iranian people have started a new hashtag, Shalom from Iran, to basically show the contrast between what they stand for and what the regime stands for. And this is going back to the apologists who are somehow trying to defend the regime and say that this is, he represents the people that's an official um, government and uh, the people are contrasting the regime and saying the exact opposite. I'm trying to just to kind of go back full circle about this kind of the apologist rhetoric versus reality on the ground. And you make a very good point. The vast majority of people in Iran want to le live at peace with their neighbors. They want to live at, uh, at peace with Israel, the Arab world. Uh, Iranians see that the billions of dollars that are being spent on the Assad regime and Hezbollah and Hamas, and we're talking about tens of billions of dollars. Uh, this is not benefiting them in any $30 way. $30 billion is the last number that we've heard that was uh, given to the Assad regime by Iran. Yeah, a member of parliament in Iran said that mm -hmm. so far the regime had given Assad $30 billion and Assad should give it back. Uh, and that's another indication uh, how big of an issue this is in Iran. Uh, the population is very well aware that its resources are being spent abroad. And regime apologists often like to blame sanctions uh, for Iran's ills and uh, what they call Iran hawks in DC and elsewhere. But really, I think it's very obvious and it, it needs to be uh, repeated as much as possible that this regime is to blame for what's happening to Iran and Iranians and really the rest of the Middle East. Uh, one, of, one of the greatest tragedies of our modern times, the Syrian conflict, is because of the Islamic Republic. If the Islamic Republic hadn't supported Assad, uh, we wouldn't have seen what's happening in Syria. And, the regime in Iran also uses the destruction it's caused in Syria to scare Iranians as well. And one of the uh, main points the regime repeats and which is echoed by its apologists in the West is that if the regime goes, Iran will become another Syria. And so uh, this regime should stay 
uh, just to uh, maintain the status quo. But in reality, uh, Iran is, are, is being destroyed daily. Um, the regime is waging war against the Iranian people by depriving mm -hmm. them of their rights mm -hmm. and their wealth and even their water. And if we look at the water issue in Iran, uh, the Islamic Republic has done great environmental damage to Iran uh, that could potentially even uh, destroy Iran as a country if it doesn't have enough water in 30 years to maintain its population. Um, so we have to be really careful about the regime's deception and mm -hmm. how it manipulates the narrative in the United States as well. It has become very capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, it did that very well during the Obama administration uh, through people like Zarif and his apologists in DC as well. But I think what's encouraged me in the last few months um, is that these narratives have been challenged and a lot less people I find are willing to believe them because the reality is looking us into the face. You know, it was the regime that uh, massacred thousands of Iranians in November. It was the regime that shot down the Ukraine uh, airliner over Tehran skies, killing uh, dozens of Canadian Iranians. Um, this is all the regime's doing and nothing can hide that. What do you make of the maximum pressure campaign and how much is the Iranian regime hurting currently? Obviously, we know that the Iranian regime also refused uh, American assistance that was offered um, as a response to the COVID-19, but the regime is really out of options at this point. How effective is the maximum pressure campaign and what could this administration continue doing, in your opinion, moving forward? As you said, the regime is out of options uh, because the economy is just uh, in such horrific condition. Uh, Iran can't export its oil or sell its oil abroad. Um, and other avenues of income have also decreased, especially with the COVID epidemic, with the closure of borders and airports and a slowdown uh, of the internal economy. I think the only option this regime has is uh, to get a new administration, or even possibly if there's a second Trump administration to negotiate with it. Um, to and do what? Negotiate? Um, to achieve what? And I was, yes. So I think what will happen, the regime will do everything possible to increase pressure on the United States mm -hmm. uh, and especially threaten Europe with the nuclear program because every time uh, the nuclear program is ramped up, it causes a lot of nervousness and anxiety in DC, Brussels, and uh, all other places, um, different European capitals. And I, you know, there are those forces in the United States and Europe that argue um, that it's best to just make a deal with this regime and contain the problem. Although I don't think this is a containable problem. Um, but even what's I think, the solution to this problem, in your opinion, the nuclear program of the Iranian regime? The solution is for the Iranian people to get rid of the Islamic Republic, and that really, that's the only solution. I don't think uh, the West. Uh, especially the United States, can fundamentally reach a just and fair agreement that's in the interest of nas U.S. national security and global security with a regime like this, given its history, uh, given its violent ideology, uh, given its complete unwillingness to reform, uh, what could be negotiated with this regime? Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, I think Iranians deserve uh, much better than this regime. And unless there are major changes uh, that happen from within Iran, we're not gonna uh, see a fundamental behavior change by this regime. I think it's all smoke and mirrors, the, the moderate myth. Um, ultimately, uh, the US maximum pressure campaign should follow, should, um, uh, be extended in order to produce results. But I also think Europe has an important role to play as well. Uh, Europe needs to exercise much more pressure on this regime. Um, Have we, the European countries a position been shifted? Where are they today in terms of, you know, we know that J JCPOA is dead, 
but what is happening within the position of European countries who were a little bit more lenient and forgiving towards the Iranian regime? Thus far, the European position has not changed. If we uh, examine the major European countries involved with the nuclear negotiations, the E3, the UK, Germany, and France, they have not officially changed their positions. There's some possibility that the Boris Johnson government in the UK might move closer to the US position on the nuclear issue. Uh, you know, there's some indications of that. Um, and there are also some other encouraging signs. For example, Hezbollah uh, has been banned in Germany and a number of other European countries are considering banning it as well. I think that's a very important extent because Hezbollah is essentially an extension of the Islamic Republic in Europe. Um, and uses Europe as a base to gather funds and recruits and spy on dissidents. To me, th those are good indications, but fundamentally Europe's position remains the same. Europe wants to go back to the JCPOA, and you and I know it's dead, but uh, there are those uh, who want to revive the JCPOA, including uh, from um, within the Biden camp. Um, we see yes, that. and this is, I mean, this is a seriously dangerous scenario looking at what happened with the first one. And basically you know, the fact that we don't even, not only that we don't know what's happened within the nuclear program, because Iran was able to have few sites that were off limits to the uh, international inspectors, but also all of the terrorism that was exported uh, throughout the region. This will be a, a very big disaster for the people in the Middle East. And that's very important, I think, for everybody who's listening to us. In your opinion, what would they be really relying on to try to revive something that failed tremendously? I think it's a function of the Islamic Republic blackmailing the rest of the world with this nuclear program. Uh, it has definitely blackmailed Europe. The Europeans, have this idea if that they, if they come to some sort of accommodation with the regime in Iran, that will decrease its destructiveness across the Middle East. And I have to say, unfortunately, that's a position the Democratic Party in the United States has adopted as well. Um, of course, we saw that with the Obama administration, uh, but we see that being repeated uh, with the current uh, Biden campaign. And a new nuclear agreement is basically telling the Islamic Republic, we won't pressure you. you. You know, when you do some of the nasty things you do in the Middle East, it's not that big of a deal to us. Uh, and I think it's a really bad position uh, for the U.S. to put itself in um, because it has gained so much leverage over the Islamic Republic uh, mm -hmm. in the last three years. Why waste that uh, leverage now? Some Biden advisors are saying that um, they'll go back to JCPOA if Biden gets elected and use that as a basis to negotiate a new nuclear agreement. But I don't really see how that's possible. And I don't, when we look at the spectrum of the regime's malign activities, these cannot be negotiated away. Uh, when we look at this regime, even now, while it's facing internal rebellion and a collapsing economy, it still continues its policies. Like, exactly. With this anti-Semitism, with helping the Assad regime. There's really, this regime is not going to go back on uh, its stated so-called principles. And I, I sincerely hope uh, that the Democratic Party uh, changes its positions. I think there are a lot of people within the Democratic Party that is still believe in some of these narratives that are uh, echoed by or encouraged by the regime as well, that there are moderates you can deal with, that Zarif isn't that bad of a guy, uh, that Rouhani is better than the rest. But this is just deception. And I hope uh, that uh, policymakers see through these deceptions and do what really works with the regime, and that is a policy of pressure. Ali Riza, you said something earlier. You said that now with the Iranian regime being out of options, it's going to continue to try to pressure the United States. What do you mean by that? Uh, do you mean by 
continuing to launch attacks on the Persian Gulf against uh, international uh, ships. I mean, what type of pressure could the Iranian regime apply? Across the Middle East uh, it would be things you mentioned, for example, the attacks against the Saudi oil installations. Uh, arming of militias and attacks, especially against U.S. forces in Iraq. Uh, the targeting of religious sites in Iran because the regime knows that will garner an international reaction. Con continued hostage taking, there are who knows how many at this point, but there are many Americans, Europeans, Australians being held hostage in Iran's prisons as negotiation ships. Uh, really, the regime will use any way possible to threaten the international community. I think the primary means will be the nuclear program. Uh, so expect uh, announcements of increased enrichment, expansion of the nuclear program. Uh, but the regime also knows that it has uh, very big vulnerabilities and that the US can exploit these vulnerabilities. And nevertheless, it's going to uh, try to influence U.S. politics and decision making over the next few months. And that's one, one thing we have to be really aware of, uh, how this regime tries to shape policy, even within, the, within D.C. and how much really is tolerated. I think an unbelievable amount of regime activity is tolerated in the United States. And this is something the U.S. government should really look into. Definitely. Uh, one of the vulnerabilities of this regime is also the rejection of its ideology, of its Islamic revolution throughout the region, not only inside of Iran, but everywhere. We see the protests in Iraq, um, the situation in Iraq, uh, Syria, and Lebanon as well. Uh, against the Iranian proxy specifically. What do you make of the changes that are happening in Iraq today and um, the Qadimi, which is the new uh, prime minister in Iraq? Uh, some people are having different uh, opinions about the fact that maybe this guy is not an Iranian puppet, but the others are saying that no, because he was also voted for by many of the Iranian militia leaders um, within Iraq. I think the... Iraqi, the new Iraqi prime minister was just pictured with, uh, in a very warm meeting with the various uh, leaders of militias backed by the Islamic Republic. The Hasht al Shabi, uh, or these militias, are very powerful within Iraq. Now, I think there is a significant minority in the Middle East that believes in the regime's ideology, but like you said, the ideology is mostly dead. What I think keeps it going is money. Uh, mm -hmm. because the regime in Iran is spending tons of money, um, tons of money on Iraqi militias and the Houthis in Yemen and the Syrian regime. Uh, once uh, the money stops or slows down, and we've seen indications of that happening. It, it is uh, slowing down, right? Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah, well, the Assad regime is under tremendous economic pressure. Uh, Lebanon's economy is under severe stress. And we're gonna talk about them, but I wanna start with Iraq. And with, with Iraq, I think the new prime minister, the proof is in the pudding. He hasn't really done anything to show that he's independent of Tehran and that he's willing to take action against militias in Iraq. As long as those militias operate in Iraq, as long as prominent militia leaders play a role in governing Iraq, I, we can't really conclude that uh, things have changed in Iraq and that the election of the new prime minister means anything. I think it's just way too soon for that. Iraq has witnessed months of protests against the Islamic Republic and its allies in Iraq, and those will continue. If we look at the trends driving these protests across the Middle East, uh, whether it's in Iraq, Syria, or Lebanon, uh, I believe these trends are uh, irreversible, uh, unless, again, there's some sort of a nuclear agreement between the United States and Iran that provides um, billions of dollars to the regime. Uh, the regime can't bail out the Leb Lebanese economy. It's going to have a very hard time bailing out Assad and paying its militias in Iraq as well. I think popular opinion has been uh, galvanized so strongly against Islamic Republic that I don't see it, that the anti-regime sentiments changing. I think that they're going to 
only increased within Iran and throughout the Middle Middle East as well. In Syria, you just started mentioning uh, the situation with uh, the Assad family in itself. I mean, there's a fragmentations within the family. There's obviously the economical situation. The economy is probably on the verge of collapse. And there's the American sanctions. We know also that because of Israel's airstrikes against the Iranian militias in Syria, um, the presence has been weakened. And we are hearing some uh, reports about the fact that Iran not only going towards the north uh, in Aleppo in Syria, but Israel continues to strike them even in uh, Aleppo. But there are comments about Iran starting to leave Syria because them staying inside of the country has become so costly, which is exactly what the Israel policy was, to make Iran's presence in Syria very costly for them. And I want to point out that this is something that a lot of people, when I look at social media, for example, people cheer on um, the Israeli airstrikes against the Iranian militias who've been slaughtering the people in Syria for the last eight years. There have been reports that the Revolutionary Guards are slowly withdrawing or tactically withdrawing from Syria. Um, Again, I think it's too soon to conclude that there's a dramatic shift of uh, the regime's policy in Syria. But I believe the Israelis have carried out maybe 1,200 airstrikes against the regime targets in the last few years in Syria. And uh, they've taken out a lot of expensive equipment and infrastructure. You know, the regime in Iran is spending billions of dollars building up this military infrastructure in Syria uh, to see it uh, destroyed by the Israeli Air Force. And you know, you mentioned people cheering this in social media. I see a lot of people cheering the destruction of the Revolutionary Guards in Syria as well by the Israelis. This is how much uh, Iranians hate the Revolutionary Guards. It's one indication. Like the Iranian people celebrate it as well. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, every time there's a there's an airstrike, Israeli airstrike against the Revolutionary Guards in Syria. Um, you know, you see a lot of people uh, celebrated on Persian language social media uh, because, again, the Revolutionary Guards just massacred thousands of Iranians on the streets of Iran in November. Uh, but the regime, there is some indication that I don't want to say its position in Syria is collapsing, but again, it's under severe stress. And there have been reports that there are tensions between Russia and Iran and Syria as well. Um, there have been reports that uh, Vladimir Putin is souring on the Assad regime. And uh, these could be motivated in part by the financial, or maybe even in large part by the financial situation. Um, neither Iran nor Russia have enough money to support Assad anymore. And so mm-hmm. this is. Uh, a drain on their resources and potentially a drain, especially in the case of the Islamic Republic, um, it's undermining its rule within Iran as well. Um, Yeah, because like in Iraq, Iraq could self-sustain. It doesn't need Iran's help. But Syria is completely a country that is, um, has no money whatsoever. And so it needs the support that these two players don't have anymore. Yeah, I mean, if you look at all the free oil and uh, cash the Islamic Republic has provided Assad in the last 10 years, it doesn't really have the means to provide that much money anymore. I I don't think it has stopped necessarily, but how long can the regime in Iran keep paying the salaries of Syrian civil servants and regime loyalists? Not... It won't be able to maintain this forever. And the same goes with Hezbollah because uh, it, even Nasser Allah, the leader of Hezbollah, has admitted he receives the majority of the group's money from Iran. And that is drying up as well. There are militias uh, in Iraq are not as dependent on Iran. Uh, well, the Iraqi government is not as dependent financially as Iran. And it also has a good relationship with the United States. So that's a very different situation. And the regime in Iran probably is not spending tons of money in Iraq like it is in Syria or Lebanon. Uh, but even in Iraq, because of the collapsing economy and uh, popular dissatisfaction with the Baghdad government, 
and the Islamic Republic as well. I think that situation is untenable. So when we look at um, the regime zone of influence across the Middle East, all the way from the Mediterranean to the Hindu Kush, it is under severe pressure, economically, socially, in every way you could imagine. Um, and you can see the destruction. I mean, you look at Lebanon too, another country that is on the verge of economic collapse. I mean, this is a pattern here. Every country yeah. that Iran put its hand on, it's complete destruction. People are starting to get hungry. I mean, people are hungry in, in Syria, for example, uh, but also in Lebanon, are they're starting to get hungry. I mean, this is a situation that they've never had probably even during their own civil war in Lebanon. And it's very tragic when we read about hunger in Lebanon and Syria and Iran, potentially very wealthy countries. Um, th this is what really worries me, frankly, about um, a potential uh, Biden presidency, that uh, the United States will leave the Middle East again. Uh, it will claim it's not a region of strategic import, which is very wrong. I think actually you can make the argument the Middle East uh, strategically is more important than ever, especially given the brewing Cold War between the U.S. and China. But I fear that this narrative among um, democratic policymakers that the U.S. needs to leave the Middle East and focus elsewhere, I think is very destructive for the people of the Middle East. And it's really bad for U.S. interests ultimately. You can't, you can't just walk away from a region that is so important historically, culturally, religiously, strategically, economically, just because the U.S. doesn't get the majority of its oil from the Middle East does not make this region less important. I think it's a very wrong way of uh, viewing this issue. And if and what US happens in the Middle East does not stay in the Middle East. No, absolutely. It never does. It never does. You know, it, it, it comes to our shores. It affects us here as well. Um, and I think the United States needs to treat these regimes more aggressively, whether it's the Islamic Republic or the Communist Party in China. These regimes are not the types of regimes that can be coddled uh, or changed. Uh, I think um, one dominant um, theme uh, in U.S. national security in the last few decades has been that uh, if these countries open up economically, they, have, they will privatize or liberalize politically. Uh, and we, you know, look at the world right now. It's exactly the opposite. The Communist Party in China has not liberalized. The Islamic Republic in Iran is as, is as bad as it has ever been and probably the most destructive it has been. Yeah, it's like giving them power only makes them more harmful to us. Yeah. And I think that's, I think the U.S. could come up with, uh, pressure policies that don't include necessarily war or military action. This is something that the Islamic Republic is good at exploiting. And it's apologists here as well. They're always threatening war. And I think a lot of Americans are just so tired of war in the Middle East that they think the best policy is just to negotiate with these guys and leave them alone. And a leave them alone policy does not work with the Islamic Republic. Um, they'll just take and take and take. Uh, and expand and expand. Um, I don't think anything will stop them unless, you know, there's a fundamental regime change in Iran. Your, in your opinion, this is the only solution is a regime change, which a lot of people agree with you on. Uh, but Secretary Pompeo two years ago said that Iran would be forced to make a choice. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they are ready to make a choice and what choice that might be? I think ultimately it's up to Ayatollah Khamenei. He makes the decisions for Iran. Um, Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards as well. And he is a very ideologically dogmatic leader. The only way I think he will be compelled to make a change is that he's not Iran's leader, frankly. <laughs> I, I, I don't see any other way around. And I think even I hear reports from within the regime uh, even within the Revolutionary Guards, that they realize this and they think he's a major impediment um, because of the policies he's pursuing and his complete unwillingness to change. Um, and so unless 
he is no longer Iran's ruler. I don't think we're going to see major changes in Iran. But that change will, I believe, will come from Iran. Um, hmm. you know, we can't predict how or when it will happen, but we've already seen a lot of indications. Iran has been in turmoil for the last two years. And everything uh, I've seen from Iran tells me that the public will no longer tolerate uh, this regime exploiting it indefin indefinitely. And we have to consider when people are hungry and are poor and have nothing, uh, they will go into the streets. Um, they will rebel. And it's not just because of economic issues. I think this is another uh, line used by the apologists that the riots in Lebanon and Iran and elsewhere are economic issues. And that's simply not true. These, these are hated regimes. Uh, the Islamic Republic is hated in Iran, it's hated in Iraq and Syria. Hezbollah is hated in Lebanon. Um, and these Islamist revolutionary movements, there's nothing to suggest that uh, they're, they're everlasting. You know, they're susceptible to the forces of history as much as any other tyrannical regimes. I will end it here. Thank you so much, Ali Riza Nader, for joining us today. Um, thank you all for listening and watching. I am Haley Buza with you with The Untold, and I would love to hear your thoughts. And please like and subscribe and send us all of your thoughts and questions, and see you next time. <laughs>